the last session of every day is a, a bit of a puzzle because by now we've made you work quite hard, you've had that lunch, you're starting to feel a little drowsy. So I thought I'd wake you up by exposing you to the world of six-legged creatures. A couple of years ago, some of you may remember how excited I was to come out here and report that I'd come across a reference, still astonishes me today, that a majority of the weight of the entire planet is actually the weight of the insects in it. And that all we see is that thin layer at the very top. It's an astonishing thought when you consider the molten core and the mountains and the oceans and all of that, that the majority of the weight of the planet can be described as being insects. So we're going to start with uh, six-legged killers, like the bark beetle. We're going to go on to six-legged sex. And finally, we're going to look into the six-legged creatures that live in your belly button. Andrew? Andrew Nikifor. Thank you. I've been described many things in my life, uh, and, and in the brochure I'm, I'm described as an insect in, investigator, um, and uh, that's perhaps one of the, the more polite definitions. Uh, and, uh, but I'm, I'm truly a reporter, and what reporters really are is that we are ambulance chasers. So we arrive at the scene of an accident, and we start, you know, how many people died, how did they die, and if there's somebody still alive, we might try to resuscitate them and then recreate the story. How did this all happen? And uh, so I'm not an entomologist, but, but, but there was a great accident and, and collision that took place in British Columbia, and uh, that involved people and trees, and bugs. And it's an extraordinary story. It's probably one of the weirdest and most wonderful stories I've come across. And in many ways, it's a very dark fairy tale. And, uh, and like every fairy tale, it is full of ideas and instructions about how to live. All right, peasants did not lecture their children. They told them fairy tales. And, uh, this fairy tale has an, a lot of things to say to us. And the first is that small things <laughs> can really change your world and turn it upside down. The second thing, and they can do it in unpredictable and improbable ways. The second thing is that nature loves volatility. We prize stability. And much tragedy and comedy results from those two very different facts. And last but not least, an aging forest, however dark, however bleak, however complex, makes a very damn fitting and frightful metaphor for an aging financial system. All right. So, let's begin the story. Uh, I mean, when I told people a couple years ago I was writing a book about beetles. They said, um, you know, they immediately thought of these guys. And I said, you know, that's not the tale. I'm really writing about creatures that, as politicians in British Columbia would say indignantly, uh, these creatures, these animals are only the size of mouse turds or of a rice kernel. And how dare they, you know, upset the whole apple cart, which they have done. So five years ago, I flew over British Columbia and I saw this scene. And I was flying from Williams Lake up to Prince George in the interior of the province, uh, which is a conifer kingdom. And everywhere I went, I saw this sea of red trees. And it's a bit like an Edgar Allan Poe story. I mean, everything was completely crimson. And I thought, you know, I, I didn't understand it. I didn't know what was going on. Um, but I thought something very important, significant, and dramatic was taking place. And that's what set me off on, on this investigation. And sure enough, I realized that what was going on in BC was actually part of a much greater and dramatic story taking place in North America. And it is about an insect that can transform landscapes faster than we can. And the transformations uh, have taken place in a number of places. In the Kenai Peninsula in the 19, late 1980s, huge outbreak of spruce beetles wiping out 
um, millions and millions of acres of, of spruce trees. And then we have this massive infestation in British Columbia with the mountain pine beetle taking out all of these lodge poles. We had in the Yukon uh, a massive infestation, again, spruce beetles in, you know, going, going through the Kalani, going through an area about four times larger than Yellowstone National Park and taking out all the trees. And then, of course, we had various outbreaks in the southwest, particularly in New Mexico, where a quarter of all the pinion trees have been wiped out. Um, and bark beetles have all played a major role in these events. So what we're talking about is really the loss of 30 billion trees in the western half of North America in the space of two decades. That to me is a dramatic event. That to me is a dramatic transformation of the landscape. And to this day, uh, every day in Colorado alone, 100,000 dead beetle trees fall to the ground. Now, who, what could have done all of this, this amazing transformation? So here are the guys, here are the characters. Um, they are an extraordinary uh, group. I mean, uh, uh, David Friedman would say they were, you know, probably born on day six of creation, probably around 4 p.m., and, uh, you know, 300 million years ago, they have co-evolved along with conifers, uh, and as you can see, they're shaped like bullets, and that's, you know, when they hit a tree, they really do hit the tree. Uh, there are 7,500 species of bark beetles. That means that there's 2,500 more species of bark beetles than there are mammals. We are mammals, and by 2050, all the scientists are saying that 25% of the mammals on this planet will cease to exist due to human activities. Now, these guys are also extraordinary in other ways. They're swarmers. So they take down their prey the same way wolves take down a moose. And they do other things as well. That one of the, the incredible things about them is that they, uh, they are also fungal farmers. All right, so they feed on fungus. They also carry fungus around. Each and every bark beetle you see here is actually a biological bus containing fungi, nematodes, bacteria, you name it, all kinds of, of creatures. Now, these beetles are part of a much bigger kingdom, the beetle kingdom, and which is, as urban folks, we have forgotten all about. In the 19th century, everyone talked about beetles. Um, Charles Darwin uh, developed his theory of evolution and natural selection all by, not all, but, but in part by observing beetles, same thing with Alfred Wallace. There were poems about beetles, there's, there were proverbs about beetles. People had, in the French, put beetles in their soup. Uh, the, you know, it, beetles were part of everyday life. Women wore them as jewelry. And for really good reason. You're looking at uh, a third of all life on the planet. A quarter of all animals on the planet are beetles, all right? And they're the world's garbage men, all right? They clean up after the plant kingdom. They keep the world a clean place. They have extraordinary diversity. Uh, you know, if the internet biologically reflected the importance of beetles, one in three uh, internet sites, sites would all be, you know, devoted to beetle sex of some kind or other. Um, so how do beetles take out trees? Uh, and this is fascinating. So I'm going to talk about mountain pine beetle. The mountain pine beetle starts, it's a female that starts the attack. She selects the tree. Scientists believe that she selects the tree on the basis of th that the tree has sent out a signal of weakness of some kind, particularly drought stress. And so the beetle, uh, a female beetle then, then picks that tree carefully. If she doesn't pick it carefully, then a whole bunch of guys are going to die as a result because tre trees are well defended. Think of them as a medieval castle. All right, they've got bark, they've got, uh, uh, they've got pitch, they will pitch out these bugs, and then if the bugs make it through the bark, then they will gas them with all kinds of, of hydrocarbons. So the female hits the tree first, she uses the tree's hard hydrocarbons to make a per perfume that says the attack has begun. Then in swarm hundreds of other beetles, and they hit that tree all at once in a matter of hours. If you're standing underneath a ponderosa pine or lodgepole, you can actually hear them chewing their way through the tree. And the battle is usually over in hours. And, and once it is over, 
those same beetles use hydrocarbons from the tree to fart out another perfume that says, hey, guys, this apartment is full. Battle's over, uh, castle has been seized, and we're now into another mode. We're going to farm this tree, and we're going to raise our kids in it, and we're going to begin the whole cycle all over again. And so it's very much a principle of overwhelming something very big. And of course, the tree is probably thinking, I'm too big to fail, and the beetles are saying, ha, 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 ha. And um, so, here's the story in British Columbia. So we have these beautiful trees, lodgepoles, you don't have them here in Toronto, and uh, they grow between 80 to uh, 120 years old, and uh, they were considered, uh, for a long, long time, a weed species. And then in the 1970s, after we had hydrated all the spruce and hydrated all the Douglas fir, we were looking around and thinking, okay, what's left? And we found a lodgepole, and we said, you know what? The thing about this lodgepole is that it will make a damn good two by four. And so that we created this incredible industry, uh, all based on, on the export of two by fours to the United States, mowing down lodge, lodgepoles. And, and so we had this very big, concentrated, highly capitalized in industry with all these mechanized sawmills. Up pops the beetle. All right, nobody did any risk assessments. Nobody thought, you we're Canadians after all. We don't think about the future. And we said, OK, uh, uh, you know, what happens if there's a, you know, fires? What happens if there are insects infestations? And what happens if, if there's some kind of threat to the mechanized supply of two by fours? And, uh, and we never, ever thought about that. And so then we had this huge beetle explosion that began around 1997, 1998, and kept on growing year after year. And here you can sort of see the evolution of the, or the growth of the beetle empire as it ate up uh, 60 to 70% of all mature lodgepoles in the interior of BC. A phenomenal event. So why did this happen? Well, there are a number of things. The first thing that happened here is that for the last 100 years, we have managed these forests um, thinking that they belong to us. We do not like fire. We will stamp out fire. Fire is volatility. We cannot tolerate fire uh, in our forests. And so we sent in Smokey the Bear with the result that our forests grow, grew more evenly and more mature over time without any natural disturbances. So by Forcing stability on the forest, we created more volatility. Um, as a result of that, now, they, we ended up with the, the amount of mature uh, lodgepole pine in the landscape increased from 15% at the turn of the century to more than 50%. So we had created, inadvertently, a smorgasbord for beetles. And then we turned up the thermostat. We always think, oh, one degree, what the hell could one degree do? Well. One degree and the absence of cold winters uh, gave the beetle empire all the advantages they needed. They were able to reproduce sometimes twice in the course of the summer. Um, they survived all of the winters in enormous numbers. And more importantly, the climate change drought stressed the trees. And a drought stressed tree is a medieval castle that has lost its moat, that has lost its defenses. And so then we responded to this disaster. We said, you know, uh, in, in BC, um, you know, politicians went around saying, what are we going to do? Um, they, they said, we, we don't have a holy crap ministry, but we could use one. And, um, uh, we, you know, BC still has not established one. But they, but they then had a biological panic, much like a financial panic. They said, okay, we've allocated these for us. We've got three big companies here. Uh, what are we going to do? All right. We'll lower the price, stumpage fees for the wood, so we'll give the wood away. Um, we'll encourage them to cut the hell out of the forest as fast as they can to see if they can beat the beetle. Um, and we'll devalue everything. And with no thought to, well, what's going to happen to the 20 to 30,000 people dependent on these forests over time? So we had this you know, classic biological panic that resulted in more concentration. Um, well, by the way, and, and some of the clear cuts were extraordinary, 100,000 acre clear cuts. And you know, the beetles just flew over these and through these clear cuts. Um, they had a great time. Uh, the numbers were so extraordinary and so thick that you could collect buckets of beetles from, from lakes in the interior. In, in one incredible flight of beetles, uh, you know, they, they flew 
hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, but they would be 2,600 feet above the canopy of the forest flying. And in some cases, there were so many beetles flying by in the course of an hour that there were enough beetles massed in the air to kill uh, 1,400 trees every hour. And they showed up on the radar of airports as rainstorms. Now, this is you know, fundamentally a story about a collapse of an aging ecosystem. Um, we have a, an agent that, uh, you know, uh, bark beetles are the world's tree engineers. That's what they're designed to do, right? They're designed to take out dead, dying, diseased, weak trees, and, and 12 species of bark beetles, the Dendoctrinus clan, are formidable tree killers. They're actually designed to take out entire forests and begin the whole process of renewal. So in the story, even though you're sort of thinking, oh, this is a story we always focus on the woe part, but you know what? Yeah, we had a big collapse. And in many parts of the forest, there is regrowth and there is renewal. Um, in Alaska, there isn't. The spruce trees are not coming back. We're getting grass. Um, in New Mexico, the pinion trees are not coming back, and we are just left with juniper forests. So we're beginning to see some very dramatic changes on the landscape uh, very much the footprint of climate change in our backyard uh, in the West. And in some places, we are seeing the renewal of forests that are naturally taken down by bark beetles so that the forest can renew itself, recharge its energy. All of these small lodgepole trees will, within a year or two, be sequestering more carbon than the old guys that they replaced. Now, where is the story going? Well, we have, you know, uh, it, that bottom patch there. That's bark beetle country. That's all lodgepole country. This is jack pine country in the boreal forest. These guys have flown over the Rockies. They did all kinds of stuff nobody thought they would do. And now they are in jack pine country, and they are moving their way across slowly. And where will it go? We don't know where it's all going to go. Uh, because there's a great deal of unpredictability and uncertainty about this. We could have a massive uh, bunch of cold winters, and perhaps they will not take out jack pine all the way across the country. Jack pine, by the way, or Canada's most iconic tree, is the tree that Tom Thompson painted in Algonquin. So why are we so worried about this, or why should we take time to think about trees and beetles again? This was the world 10,000 years ago. Two-thirds of it was forested. A bark beetle known as human beings came around, and this is how we have transformed the landscape. The problem here is that there's not much left, and what is left, these white spruce forests in the north are among the most resilient and important forests in all of the world because they have endured more climate change and have responded um, to, to more climate change events than any other tree. This is the tree that we must really protect for the future. So when you go to the West, if you go on holidays, um, you will see country like this. You will see dead trees. You will see trees that are turning red. And you will see, um, uh, the, in this case, the remnants of, of a forest fire. So, what do we take away from, from this story? What are the beetles really trying to tell us? Well, I guess they're trying to tell us, number one, that you don't achieve stability by stamping out vol volatility. What you get is more volatility in kind, and greater volatility, and much greater vulnerability. Um, they're telling us that our economic systems have gotten too big, too concentrated, too complex, and that what Mother Nature really likes are really a lot of small characters on the landscape, small enterprises with a rich degree of diversity and that have an enormous amount of resilience, not the kind of concentrated big things that, that we have seen. The story is telling us that, yes, uh, there, there is nothing too big that cannot fail. And, um, and last but not least is that after collapse comes renewal of one kind or another. It was a very great poet, William Blake, um, who also loved beetles and also loved people and also loved trees. And 
He probably put it this way, and he, this is the guy who could see universe in a grain of sand. And he said, you know, man was made for joy and woe. And the sooner this we know, more safely through the world we will go. Thank you.